This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and today uh, I have the distinct pleasure of having a f- another former classmate, a uh, high school classmate, Dr. Jamie Jakish. Thank you com- for coming on, Jamie. If you wouldn't mind kind of filling everyone in on what it is you do, what is your background? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm a hospitalist is my title. I, my residency was internal medicine, so internal medicine is not surgical. It's treating patients who are 18 up to whatever age. And it frequently deals with older patients just because those are the people who tend to have more medical problems. But uh, we kind of treat the whole range. So I don't do pediatrics. I don't do surgery. But as I said, I'm a hospitalist. So I'm in a hospital setting all the time. I don't have a clinic. I don't have my own panel of patients. If anybody goes to the hospital, whether you have a heart attack or whether you have a stroke or a psychiatric reason or infection, we will frequently see those patients. And then if we need other specialists, like you've had heart surgery or a stent, then we'll get a cardiologist or somebody else to see you. So we're kind of the jack of all trades, master of none of the hospital. So Awesome. Thank you so much for being on. And while I'm busy thanking people, I'd like to thank our sponsor, NAPA. Accomplish more by starting now. That's the motto of Repair Shop of Tomorrow, a Napa Auto Care exclusively endorsed vendor. Repair Shop of Tomorrow will look at productivity, efficiencies, effective labor rate, average hours per car, labor profit percentage, measure and manage labor, and how you can create net profit. Interested in Repair Shop of Tomorrow? Call 440-545-1230 for a free 20-minute no-obligation consultation or contact your servicing Napa Auto Parts store. All right, so I think the dying question is, is when is the machine from Idiocracy coming? Is that at the hospital yet, where we just stand in there and you got a few probes? (laughs) I briefly watched that show. What was it again, the machine? It would diagnose you or something? Idiocracy. I saw it a little bit. What did it do, the machine? Evidently, when connected properly, it would diagnose you. In the movie, the uh, doctor or whatever he was, the machine operator seemed to have some issues about what which probe went where. Uh, one was supposed to go in the uh, mouth and the other, the sphincter, and I think he, he messed it up, so he had to get it. Took him a couple shots to get it right. He had to rinse his mouth out with some Brondo. <laughs> Brondo, yes, that's right. I remember the Brondo. <laughs> the thirst mutilator. They gave him a name. He like he like swore or something, and that was his name or something. But yeah, well, he had to go get his uh, tattoo of his um, bar, essentially a barcode. Um, they asked him like his name and how to spell it, and then he accidentally was trying to delete it back and says not sure that his name was not sure. There you go. Yeah, it's a documentary. I didn't know it might be a documentary. If if we keep going, you never know. Yeah, you didn't get your PhD from Costco. So. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, obviously, we have uh, a lot of machines which are helping us figure things out. But as far as AI, it's not ready for prime time. We don't have full self-driving yet, so. but uh, they're working on it in various angles. I think Watson, the IBM Watson, they have like a Watson Health or something like that. I know dip their toe in the water as far as like, you know, diagnosis. I I think it actually could be of some use to some people in cancer therapy because there's so many new cancer drugs coming out that it's really hard even for the cancer doctors to keep track of, you know, what trials are out there, what's available, what new drugs or investigational treatments if somebody's failing. And I think Watson has tried to have a program where you kind of input the patient's problems and symptoms, and then it will spit out, you know, like some recommended things to try or something like that. There's no automated intelligence machine for me. There's no like no machine that tells us like what they think the problem is or something like that. Obviously, the radiologists, they do their scans and things like that. And the radiologists give us recommendations what they think it is. And I think they've also tried some artificial intelligence as far as reading those CT scans and MRIs. And it's not quite ready and it might not be ready for probably a decade or more, I'm guessing, just because you can't tolerate much error 
because people get hurt if there's too many errors. So, and then there's a question of who do you, the legal aspects too, with the AI, like who, who's responsible? Is it, you know, is it the manufacturer of the machine? Is it the doctor who's supposed to be overseeing the machine and all those things? So there's a lot of liability that people are not sure how to apportion that liability. So it's an area which will become more prominent with time. It's just not clear when or exactly how involved it's going to be. So I don't know if it's going to be a idiocracy machine or not. Some parallels there with uh, autonomous vehicles about who would be liable. Uh, you said something about like keeping track, all the new drugs, all the new treatments, all the new, maybe not even, um, I suppose, like diagnostic techniques or maybe some new equipment or tools or procedures, protocols to to diagnose or handle a situation. Um, I probably should have wrote it down, but you know, things do change and change rapidly. I think there's like a running gag or a, maybe not a gig, but a joke or something that auto techs will tell themselves that the human body hasn't changed in you know hundreds or thousands of years and cars are changing by the minute. And, but that's not necessarily what you need to memorize as much as how these things, other things are changing. And one idea that popped in my head when you were talking was the actor John Ritter. And uh, when he got sick and passed away rather rapidly, wasn't it like a burst aneurysm, aortic or something like that? And when they brought him into the hospital, they thought he was having a heart attack and treated him that way. And it ended up, there were signs that that was not the case. So now they have a, a new protocol. I thought his name was associated with it, but it may not be where under that those circumstances, you check this, this, and this to avoid taking a right instead of going left for the, I'm almost positive it was like an aortic aneurysm uh, that burst. Actually, the way you describe it makes total sense to me. I guess I don't remember the full details, but that is a situation you have to worry about because most people who come with chest pain, it's going to be like a clot, a thrombus or something in your vessels, your coronary vessels, the vessels that service the heart. If they get blocked, you have a heart attack and it's a problem. So most of the time people are having an issue. If they're coming in with chest pain, it's going to be a blockage there. And usually you're going to give a blood thinner to try to break that up. The problem is if it's like a, a dissection, meaning if the aorta is is has like a, a tear in it, if you give a blood thinner, that thing could burst and it's going to be very difficult to save somebody because it's the largest artery in the body. And when it bleeds, you have to have a surgeon basically right there if it bursts like that to have a decent chance. It's not something you can wait on. So that's probably what it was, is telling people to be more aware. And, and so they do have, I mean, we've kind of picked up, medicine has picked up a few things from other industries. Like the reason air safety got a lot safer, you know, in a lot of ways is because they started having more of a regimented checklist for things that they have to do before the flight. And surgeons have done that too, where they have to have, you know, there's been wrong site surgeries where they'll take off, you know, the wrong leg or the wrong kidney. And so they've kind of had this more protocol based approach to surgery uh, where they have to go through the checklist and things like that. And I think in the ER, like what you're talking about, they do have some protocols that you should follow. And when we open up, we have a, a medical record. So when we open it up, like I will put in like for a chest pain admission, I'll have like an order set that will have some like preset orders that will tell me, you know, what should be done generally for a chest pain or this or that or the other thing. So there are some guidelines that way, but you still have to use uh, your reasoning to figure out what's appropriate or not based on their patient. And there are infinite variations in your patient, not just their medical problems and their past history, you know, allergies or what has worked for them in the past or their other problems, but also their preferences, which can vary widely. I do want this. I don't want this. I want a little of that, but not so much of this. So there's a lot of variation there. So you have to, you have to use your thinking skills in addition to whatever guidelines are there. How would you say you keep on top of that? Like when protocols change or something new, new treatments are coming out. That's got to be a big training thing. Like you're required to have X amount of hours, I think, or, or credits even to maintain licensure. What are some of the ways that you can keep on top of, I guess, new technology really? Well, we have to do, you know, continuing education 
You do as well. I'm I'm assuming for you know your auto repair, you have a certain amount of continuing education hours you got to do. Or we don't have to nothing. Honestly, no. There is no. Some states have some licensure. Most do not. Some smog states require uh, to have a smog license, that which is really just to test the exhaust for emissions. Uh, they have to take a exam. But really, everyone else, and we'll just pick on me here. There is nothing. I am required to do by any governing body or overseeing body. If you want to be a professional auto mechanic or professional auto technician, you simply need to get a job at a shop or open your own and you're in, you're in the fraternity. But the other side of it is maybe more importantly is if I really want to stay on top of things, then yeah, um, I probably do really at minimum 80 hours of training a year in some sort of a classroom type setting or seminar type setting. And then above in that, above that is just pure curiosity driving me to buy books or access to, I guess, digital copies of books uh, to read. There's certain sources I find online videos of either other professional technicians kind of showing off case studies or their findings. Uh, so it's really self-motivated. No, that sounds like a lot. I mean, 80 hours is a lot of seminar time and other things. So you might be an outlier there. You also have a podcast doing this. So clearly you're invested probably more than the average Joe. There's a lot of technicians out there that invest a lot of time in continuing at their education but yeah unfortunately it should be more it should be way more but yeah yeah so for us we have fairly strict licensure requirements as far as i think it's like 50 hours a year for just the state portion they do it on a three-year period so i think it's like 150 hours every three years which really isn't that much but then there's a national requirement as well your licensing body. So I'm internal medicine. So I have to keep up with, you know, their continuing education. And that's, I don't know, I'm assuming, I don't know if it's broken down to hours specifically, but it would be something like that much again in national requirements. So some of ours, we can get, you know, trained because I, I have to look up. So if somebody comes in with something I don't deal with a lot, which happens a lot because I deal with <laughs> everything kind of. So there's a lot of things I don't know. So I have to look these things up. And so we have a program which is ubiquitous for us. It's like, for me anyway, and people in my profession and for a lot of other professions, it's called Up to Date. And it's this really awesome resource where basically, like if somebody comes in, they say they have, I don't know, somebody asked me, you know, what labs can you check to see if somebody has melanoma? And, you know, I'm not a cancer doctor, so I go look it up and we have up to date and it gives us all the most pertinent information and it's up to date, meaning it's constantly updated so that it's being has the freshest information. So by virtue of me just looking things up and reading these articles, I will get some credit for reading all these articles and I have to do it all the time. So to some extent, I get a lot of my credit just by working and looking things up because this this tracks how much time I'm spending and what I'm reading. But there are a lot of doctors and stuff who go to conferences. Um, you know, we have weekly conferences at work, educational stuff, you know, st update on stroke or this or that, maybe a couple hours at lunchtime or things you do. So we have things that are kind of constantly rolling educational type things that you can join in on and get credit for. That's an interesting idea that if there was a way to track certain information access to uh, have that contribute to some sort of a, a credit, uh, educational credit of some sort. I don't want to say just by working, but like you're saying, researching to do your job. I have a car to diagnose and it's something I'm not all that familiar with that just the fact of me researching that is somehow uh, accredited. That's kind of interesting. That's a really interesting idea. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, it's something to think about. I mean, it would, you know, but I guess if you guys don't have strict requirements, it might not be as critical for you. We do. So we kind of have to have a way to track it somehow. Yeah, I think many years ago. Maybe in the 70s, there was um, a push by the government to kind of get involved. I'm not knocking this idea. I'm rather supportive of it. We created an entity called ASE, the 
automotive service excellence and they're a test administrator, test developer and administrator, but they're voluntary. And so they divide it up into categories, you know, like, so engine repair, engine performance, which would be kind of like drivability, diagnostic, stuff like that, electrical, heating and AC, stuff like that. You can take those exams and get certified, but it doesn't really, you know, not having those certification doesn't necessarily prevent you from working professionally. You're not required to have them other than, I mean, maybe a couple of counties and states might require uh, some certifications to maintain a license. But other than that, we don't, we have nothing. I don't know if that's good or bad, right? You know, there's the argument with like hairdressers and uh, st- stuff like that, where they're required to be licensed. And is that good or bad? You know, if you are licensed kind of in favor of it, because it kind of keeps your some exclusivity, but if you're not, and you need more hairdressers, it becomes kind of a restriction. Yeah. And we do have other licensure requirements. Like you know, you have to pass your board exam initially. And then it used to be like for my dad, who did, actually was the same specialty I am. He didn't have to take any other certifying exams after he passed the first one, after his residency, after medical school, after he passed that, I think he was done. He just had to do his continuing education credits. Now, they changed that, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. So now we have to take a test every 10 years. And it's kind of like some six to eight hour tests and you have to pass it every 10 years. And so that's what I do. But people, there's there's some variations. You can do it every two years or something like that. You can do like a smaller test or something. But I just do the every 10 because I find it most convenient. So the older doctors are grandfathered in. They don't have to do that. But the newer ones have to you know keep up with that. There was a mini revolt uh, like a couple of years ago because they changed the requirements. They said the pace of information is changing too much. We have to have you doing more things. And of course, more things are going to cost more. And it gets, you know, it's a couple grand a year or something like that, that they added the costs onto. So there was kind of a mini revolt of people like saying, well, hey, they kind of have a monopoly on us, which they do. I mean, if they're the licensing body, they can say, hey, I want you to spend $5,000 every couple of years. What are you going to do? Because if you're not licensed, you know, you can't work. But we have, and I don't know how it is for you, but some doctors felt like it was kind of a monopoly money grab. Like they can basically, you know, dictate whatever they want and what are you going to do about it? But that seems to have blown over. So we just kind of we just kind of take it. <laughs> what are you going to do? Hey guys, Matt here talking to you about what the Napa Auto Care Center program can do for your business. You probably already know the Napa brand is the most recognized and trusted name in the automotive aftermarket industry. In fact, studies show nearly 95% of customers recognize Napa and associate it with quality parts, service, and technical expertise. So why not complete a Pro Image upgrade and take advantage of that. Pro Image is a co-branding program for the exterior and interior of your shop. On the outside, it includes the Napa colors and distinctive Napa signage. While the public may know you as a reliable, locally owned business, a Pro Image upgrade helps set your shop apart from the competition even further. It is also a visual signal to your customers and potential customers that you and Napa are partners. Most importantly, Pro Image really works. This co-branding opportunity has helped Napa Auto Care Centers across the country increase their car counts and sales. In fact, those that have completed the ProImage project enjoy an average of 23% sales increase during their first year. ProImage upgrades are also available for the interior of your shop. A ProImage interior upgrade transforms your customer waiting area from merely utilitarian to warm and welcoming. The goal is to maintain your shop's independent identity while enhancing the customer's experience. You can get a free look at what a Pro Image exterior or interior upgrade can look like by visiting the Napa Auto Care member site and clicking on the Napa Pro Image link under the Napa Pro Image tab. Or contact your local Napa Auto Parts store. Your servicing Napa store can tell you more about Pro Image plus the hundreds of other reasons to become part of the Napa Auto Care family, the largest network of independent auto repair shops in the country. We have people that no matter what, they're not going to be happy with the cost of the, so the voluntary and on the flip side, you have people that, you know, the exams, any exam, right? They think it's a money grab. You're passing the minimum 
requirement. If you do just enough to pass, that is the minimum, even though the fail rates are not overly important, but some of the fail rates on some of the exams are really close to 50%, and the more advanced exams are closer to 70% fail rate. But they feel like the bar is too low, that if we keep raising that bar, then we won't have so many quote-unquote hacks out there. Uh, It turns out I don't think that's... There's a lot of issues with feeling like that bar is too low. Remotely true, that if we ended up requiring this accreditation that's currently voluntary but made it required, that it would break the industry. We would break the uh, auto repair industry. and We would not be able to have near... We don't have enough text the way it is. There would be even less, way less. And well, the failure rate that high, yeah, I would imagine so. The vast majority of tasks out there, you don't necessarily need the best of the best of the best. And honestly, for you know what I mean? Like there are those certain vehicles, there are certain problems where yes, you need the higher skilled, more knowledgeable technicians, but I wouldn't say we've had a revolt. Yeah, yeah. Well, you haven't had to. But I don't think we're gonna revolt. Day to day, it's not the case. You just don't run into that. I think mostly they're well meaning. So you know, as long as as long as there's value in what they're saying that and I think they're right that the pace of information, the number of medications that are coming out and the changes and therapies and stuff, it is faster. It gets faster every year it might develop, but it's, it's not that, I mean, they do have a point. It seems like it could be almost overwhelming. The amount of choices for treatments available or that's what comes to mind first is there's so many different options, so many treatment options and picking out what's the right one and balancing all the information, like the stuff you rattled off, that just seems like that would be almost overwhelming. Like, And I'm sure there's a lot of parallels with your job because me especially, I'm kind of your first stop in the hospital for things. And so I have to know what I know and I have to know what I don't know because if I don't, then I have to get the proper person involved. And, you know, I suppose same thing with an auto tech. There's just something you're just not comfortable with. You got to know when you're kind of out of your, you know, your knowledge base, your what your expertise is. And you have to refer something to either another tech you work with or, you know, maybe even another shop or whatever. We have, you know, a new change is that we have more people who aren't trained as highly like nurse practitioners or or uh, physician assistants, PAs and NPs. And so they don't have the length of training. So their expertise might not be as broad or deep. You know, there's going to be more and more nurse practitioners coming online because there aren't enough primary care doctors to see all the patients. So it's going to be necessary because we have an aging population, right? I mean, uh, you know, the boomers are what just hitting kind of social security age and all that. So, so we're going to need more and more people but those people aren't going to be quite as highly trained. So they might be referring more or, you know, doing less work up than maybe, you know, a physician might, but, but they largely, they do a, a good job. So I think they've been a big help, but you know, there's concerns with some doctors, whether they're trained highly enough and things like that. It's maybe a dangerous question. I think it's generally accepted throughout society, and it might be a generational thing, right? No matter what, an older generation is going to look at the younger generation as less. They don't possess the same level of critical thinking. And I'm just curious, like, you know, an auto repair lack a lot of that mechanical aptitude, a lot of that critical thinking, deductive reasoning. And I'm just curious, like, is that something noticed in the medical field? If you're talking about physicians, no. I mean, I think the quality is good. So just because we keep a pretty tight lid on the number of people who get trained. It seems like the overwhelming number of younger individuals coming in. The rate limiting step training spots, because they help for the U.S., is that pay for the training of people. So and there's not enough for the number you need. So I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say there's 17,000 MDs who are minted. The government only will support so many each year, but we need something like 24,000 or something like that. So those people have to come internationally or, you know, other things like that to do their residencies here. So And it's hard to get in. It's extremely hard to get into medical school. So you are getting generally very highly qualified, 
you know, pretty sharp people. I don't know this any change at all. I mean, I think they're very well trained, but the variety is more with some of these nurse practitioner uh, schools because their requirements are not as uniform and they're some of them are like online programs and that's and and they don't have nearly as many clinical hours like actually in the hospital seeing patients like they'll have a, a you know like a fourth of what an MD will do as far as clinical hours sometimes maybe even less that's when it becomes a concern because the quality control I don't think has been firmly set. And again, I don't mean to disparage a group of people because I, I know lots of extremely good nurse practitioners that are just as good or better than the, some doctors that I know. And so, you know, the it's just that there's a much more of a uh, variability, I would say. But I've also met some who just aren't ready. You know, they're missing too many things and things like that. They're the minority. The ones I work with are excellent but I work in a probably a little bit more higher pressure. We're getting patients from outlying hospitals like Olivia Hospital or Redwood Falls Hospital, these smaller hospitals. So, you know, we're seeing kind of the cases that they don't want to treat or can't treat. You know, there's not a lot of latitude for not being kind of on your game to an extent. I think that's kind of where I see the variability right now. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't have like the pressure of health, but I sympathize greatly with a human life, humans able to provide services uh, on vehicles that are won't. Module programming and surrounding facilities can't. Certain levels of diagnostics, stuff like that. Uh, certain car lines will service uh, car lines other facilities don't want to service or cannot service. So I sympathize with like that, that, that kind of environment of seeing so many things because of that. I think a point too that you're like that generational drop, if you will, alluding to the reason you may not have that variation with skill gap is because of the amount of training you go through. Not just after you've achieved your PhD and initial uh, past your boards and other licenses, but leading up to that, how much education did it take to get just to start being a MD? You have to have your undergrad degree, obviously, and then you have to, what's the total education? Is that the question, basically, what you need to do? Yeah. It's usually four years of medical school after college, and then it's three years is the absolute minimum after that. So college, four years of med school, minimum three years after that, and it can go up to seven, eight, nine, ten, depending on, mine was actually one of the shortest because I'm a generalist. So mine actually is about as short as you can make it, which is kind of what I wanted. I kind of wanted to get out and get going. But I did a three-year what you're doing. So uh, like surgeons, for instance, they have to have more years. So residency. So that's what, four, four, three. So, you know, 11 years is kind of the minimum if you're counting college. And then people like cardiothoracic surgeons who you are operating on the heart and lungs and heart bypasses and heart valve repairs and those guys uh, need, you know, something like seven years of a residency. So aneurysm repairs and things like that, four years of med school, and then seven after that, and sometimes even more if they want to do some other specific type of surgery. So yeah, it can be pretty long. I mean, a lot of people aren't uh, into their low to even mid thirties by the time that they're done training, even if they start right out of, you know, college. I would say we're almost the opposite. What I've noticed there, there might be a few four-year type degrees uh, in auto technology, maybe. Uh, I would say I was an outlier because I had three years. I went to two years of a auto technology program and then a third year dedicated to really electrical and drivability. I think the vast majority now, that's kind of rare. It's more like a year, year and a half. In my two years, vehicle sophistication has increased I graduated with 104 credits fairly dramatically. I don't know if it's quite half, but they have significantly fewer credits than I had. Shorter. And that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier. We're taking people that grew up in a world that was less, and yet I think our training has gotten... Uh, I mean, one thing, I grew up, around on a, grew up on a farm and a farm implement dealer. 
So that's that's already should be out the window. But a lot of us grew up in houses where mom or dad would fix something, take apart the toaster or fix your bike. You know what I mean? And so it's a lot more mechanical. We got to see a lot more and interact with things. Where now that's not really the case. Everything's very software. Screen time. So we're taking kids with less mechanical aptitude, putting them into a shorter program to come into a profession that requires not only like mechanical aptitude, but also to be able to visualize how things work together and produce whatever goal. So that that's kind of, I think, why we are suffering from that more so than you are, that your profession, because the filter is a lot better. Maybe not the filter so much, but filter is probably a horrific word, really, because it's really the training and the time to bring somebody up to speed is there. Like you said, at minimum 11 years. And if it took longer, right, you needed somebody to sign off and your residency that like, OK, Jamie's ready to go. If they didn't think so, then you might have had to spend another year or two. Yeah, they do that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have that at all. So that's kind of interesting to me that there's some uh, there's some stuff that we talk about, you know, maybe not 11 years, but taking from or borrowing or learning from the medical. I think we could certainly justify four and five years profession medical field. Uh, I don't know if that's one of them, but we probably should. I suppose the big difference is hospital. It's hard to correlate a hospital to a small business, but I think we can adapt a little bit. Yeah, with the just the explosion in technology that you guys are probably dealing with as well as us, you do have to have some judgment. You have to have somebody who's got some idea of what do I do with these results that I'm getting? You know, is this a true result? Is this you know, a false for us, it's you know, is it a false positive or a false negative? Does this fit the picture of what I'm looking at? I don't know how it goes for you guys, but for me and my job, especially with more time, a lot of my you know, work is like pattern recognition, I would say. Like people come in and there's kind of a, I don't know, it's hard to describe because after you do it long enough, but you just, you can just tell kind of what pattern somebody's coming in with. You see what they've come in with before, how they're presenting, how they look what they're telling you, and it kind of just fits into a pattern that you've seen before. Some of it is intuition, and then you got to take in just the data that you're getting, the labs, the images, the x-rays, all this stuff. And again, you kind of come up with a plan. But a lot of it is, for us, pattern recognition. You know, sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you think it's a certain pattern and you're wrong. So you have to try to, for us, you got to keep it kind of broad at the beginning because you always have to account for the fact you could be wrong. And sometimes you have to account for the fact that the patient might not be telling you everything that occasionally happens too. So sometimes they'll, they'll not give you the best, or maybe they can't, maybe they're confused or, you know, so you have to get your information from whatever source you can, family members or other things. So that's kind of how we go about it, but it is crucial to have somebody who can critically evaluate that information. Otherwise you're going to get you know, a warning, like maybe for you, you get a warning light and maybe it's not a true thing that needs to be fixed, or maybe it's just an error reading or something that's not actually there. So you do need some judgment. So I know you're talking about training for you guys and such, and I don't know what kind of training you need, but I do think you need somebody who is able to, you know, kind of work their way through those things and decide what's important and what's not. That's a hundred percent. That last part, especially, but I agree. So a lot of people, when you say pattern recognition, may take that to mean um, like bullets, silver bullets, we call them. So this car comes in and it's a Ford and it's a Ford F-150 with a whatever 5.4 liter V8 and it's got a misfire. The silver bullet will be spark plugs and coils. That that will be the silver bullet. And you're going to be right a lot. You're going to be right a lot. That's one pattern recognition. The other is... I think more in tune with what you're talking about in that I know that this system is, you know, a mass airflow sensor system. And I know that if I have fuel trims reading negative at idle and way positive under load, most likely I have a error calculation error, which would be a contaminated mass airflow sensor. The fix is replace the mass airflow sensor. That would be pattern recognition as well and much more in line with what you're talking about because I'm taking legitimate data along with how a system functions. 
and you know, and a- analyzing it and making a diagnostic decision. That's probably going to be right. That's a direct correlation to what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it sounds very similar, I think. Yeah. I don't know. A lot of times I kind of relate us almost more to veterinarians in that, you know, we have different animals coming in. Not that they're so different, right? You know, animals, they have legs and hearts and lungs and all that. And then car comes in, it's got wheels and engines and transmissions, but they go about things a little bit differently or they have different tendencies and stuff like that. Car can't really talk to us. They can't explain to us our their symptoms. So then you got the owner, you know, talking about their dog just lays around just lazadacical or something like that. Then we have to use equipment measuring tools of some sort to try to further gain information about symptoms and and whatnot to point us in the right direction. And scan tools might, they might be a means of gaining a way to talk to the patient, if you will. You know, it hurts here. You know, the circuit is not performing the way it's expected. So I I suppose there's a correlation there. But a lot of the uh, more intrusive tests you have I think correlate a lot to what we have. So you have like an EKG in our world, that's a digital storage oscilloscope. You know, I don't know how many, how many leads are on an EKG. Yeah. They have 12 leads. Is it 12? Okay. So that would be like a 12 channel oscilloscope or 12 channel um, data logger. And most of ours are two channel, four channel and some eight channels. And we're hooking up to get voltage off of a vehicle direct measurements. So you're looking at the um, voltages to the heart involved with the heart. We're looking at voltages directly involved with the ignition system. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at patterns, you know, because we've, we know a theory, some theory of electricity and how certain things behave. We can look at a waveform and determine certain characteristics and make a diagnosis based on that. Is it good, bad? Can I make a call? This is bad. It needs this part or I'm going in this direction. You know, the whole pattern recognition thing, I think, is a very human thing, right? I mean, go back to hieroglyphics. That's that's how we communicate. It is symbols, and symbols are signatures, and that's what we're looking at. I think a lot of that stuff correlates very directly. I don't mean that like we're I'm trying to put us on the same... No, but I mean, I think there's a lot of similarities. When you're, we're both trying to figure out a problem with a fairly complicated piece of machinery, whether it's a human body or whether it's a car... I mean, I think some of the approaches are going to be the same. But as far as for me, I mean, again, just kind of getting back a little bit to the philosophy of how you figure out what's going on with somebody. So a good principle to follow, I would say for us, is only do what you need to do. Don't blast out all kinds of tests and labs because you're going to get results you're not going to know what to do with. And it's they're maybe not going to be relevant or like, let's say... If I don't know, someone comes in with, you know, maybe a pneumonia, but instead I do a full body, you know, I do a CT scan of their chest, abdomen, all this stuff. I'm going to find, you know, maybe a little something that's not quite right on the kidney and, oh, maybe it's something, maybe it's not. Then you got to spend more time. Maybe you got to biopsy it. Maybe they get some bleeding event from the biopsy. And now you've got yourself into this weeds that you didn't really need to, and it probably wasn't going to be a problem, but probably isn't good enough because, you know, well, we, it's a 2% chance of cancer. Well, that's not good enough. You kind of need to know or not. You get trapped into all these workups that can really complicate things. So I think it really, I try to keep things as simple as I can, as far as giving medications, again, medications are the same thing. Like, Medications are great when they have a specific purpose involved, but if you're just kind of throwing a bunch of meds at people, they're going to get side effects. The medications will interact with each other. I really try to strip it down to the essentials and start one thing at a time and go slowly, unless, of course, the situation doesn't allow for it. If somebody's kind of crashing and not doing well, then you have to change up your approach. But I think that's where some... And I'm not perfect by any means, but that's where some doctors get into trouble as they kind of do too many things or sometimes they don't do enough. And other times they're just kind of blasting away on some of these things or treating things that don't need to be treated. So there is a fair amount of judgment 
involved in how you go about it. And, you know, I don't know ex- exactly how expensive your diagnostics are, but clearly medicine is not cheap. So you don't want to be doing a lot of tests for that reason either. I mean, it's it's a kind of a costly business. So you have to use like a little bit of discernment of what you're actually going to do and test for. Yeah. The cost of our diagnostics are the same customer to customer, but their perception of it being expensive or reasonable seems to change drastically between individual to individual. And it doesn't seem to be correlated to how nice a vehicle it is or uh, their income or anything like that. It's, I don't know, whatever their belief structure is based off of history or whatever that determines whether my uh, diagnostic is, uh, my charging is uh, reasonable or not. I mean, everybody knows healthcare is expensive, so they kind of everybody's been forewarned. I mean, auto care it probably can vary a little bit. People probably feel like it should be a whole heck of a lot cheaper than it actually is, or something like that. I'm sure you're running into that problem all the time. In that case, it's such different worlds because it's not like there's a couple other hospitals a block or two away where one's giving away free diagnostics. There's no one down in the next town over giving away, you know, free MRIs. You know what I mean? Like you you come in for a free MRI with every physical. They don't do that. We have stuff kind of like that where they will free diagnostics if you let us repair the car. So it took me three hours to figure out this uh, broken wire buried in the harness that was intermittently touching but I found it and okay, well, you're going to have us fix it. The diagnostics is free. You know, the analysis is free. That's something, again, that we probably needed to learn from the medical field is that people are not paying you for a diagnosis. They're paying you for analysis. It's this much for this test. It's this much for this test. And then I will take the, or you will take the results of these tests and I will come up with a diagnosis. We're not very good at that. I think we've not studied a dictionary very well, for one, and misused the word diagnosis and diagnostics. And we essentially are charging people for the result, not the means to get to the result. And that's a that's a big mistake on our part. It's just we're really good at devaluing what we do. I'm not saying we need to overvalue it. Man, we're really good at devaluing it. Really good at devaluing it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, that doesn't seem totally the same for sure. I'm not as aware of what uh, the auto business is like, but yeah. Is there a problem for you guys as far as like someone does a free diagnostic? So then they said, we'll give it to you free, the diagnostic, but only if you get your car repaired there. So if you say, no, thanks for telling me what the problem is. I found something cheaper somewhere else. So then will they charge them for the diagnostic stuff? Yeah. And if they do, you know, so there's some kind of economics involved too, where if I'm analyzing a vehicle, we'll use that broken wire scenario again, where it took me, you know, a couple hours to track down where this, you know, what was going on. You know, I suspect I have a circuit issue. I track it down. I think I have a a broken wire and now I have to find where it is located. And it took me a couple hours. Even if you let me fix it, the repair is probably in, in parts is going to be basically a butt connector and a, maybe some heat shrink. And that's the fix. So parts are probably under $20. They're probably under $10, mm-hmm. but it took me two hours to figure it out. If I would have brought your car in for a water pump and it took me two hours, not only do I profit off the labor and I don't need the most expensive equipment in the shop to do it, you know, cause the scan tools and everything, you know, maybe they're not the most expensive, but some of the more expensive stuff in the shop. But I'm profiting off the water pump, the part itself, which is more expensive because that's probably, you know, a couple hundred dollars on its own, maybe more. And the coolant and, you know, I have all these parts, you know, two profit um, streams, if you will, where on the analysis, it's really just the one. And economically, the rate for diagnostics you know, or a diagnostic analysis should be significantly higher than the regular labor rate to do the water pump. That would be logic. Most shops don't do that. Most of them don't. Most are very almost embarrassed to sell and charge for it because it's somewhat intangible. I'm not handing you anything. 
So if I put a water pump in your car, I can show you the old water pump and, you know, there's something tangible there. It's easier to sell. Well, you guys might be a little bit different too. I don't, most doctors now, like for me, for instance, I work for a hospital. So the diagnostic stuff and things like that, that's, I just do whatever I feel like needs to be done, but there's nothing that, you know, I don't get any like residuals or anything from stuff I order and things like that. So so there's there were there used to be doctors used to be more small, small businesses, but now they're more increasingly employed by larger you know, institutions and things. So, so yeah, so I'm not sure that's more maybe more of an issue for you guys at this point than it is for us because I don't really think about it. other than that I don't want to do expensive things, especially if if I don't need to. But as far as what I you know personally get paid, it doesn't matter if I do 12 MRIs or zero MRIs, for instance. And I guess I don't know how a hospital handles it too. And I wouldn't expect you to know either. It's interesting to me. If I'm going to do a certain test on one car, just for a bad example, a fuel pressure test, I'm going to connect a gauge. Some vehicles, it's very easy to do. It's very easy to do. So charging them for a fuel pressure test on that car would be much different than a fuel pressure test on another car that it's brutally difficult. That there's there's stuff that has to ta- be taken apart. There's a lot of time invested in just getting access to the system to be able to test it. So it's really hard to be super uniform. I'm wondering, I get it, like maybe gastric bypass would be a bad example. It's popping into my head. Like somebody of certain circumference reasonably could be this much for the gastric sleeve or bypass. But if they're a much larger circumference, it's going to take longer. So the charge might be higher. And, and, you know, I don't know. I don't, Some of that stuff, like, you know, if you have to use a larger blood pressure cuff, is it a higher rate? I, I doubt it. Maybe. Yeah, gastric bypass is kind of a tough one because you're doing a surgery for obesity. But they do want you under a certain amount of weight. Like, there's the most surgeons don't want to do it on somebody who's like 400 plus, 500 plus, not like a big open operation. Because you're cutting through all that tissue, the tissue doesn't join together very well, so then you can get like wound issues. And so in a lot of this, surgeons are, they're monitored based on their success rate or lack of complications. And so you're going to get more complications with with a 500-pound patient rather than a 300-pound or 250-pound patient. So, So a lot of them will want you to try to get your weight down to show that you're committed to trying to get your weight down and try to get you to have some weight loss before they will take you for surgery and things like that. So, yeah, that could launch into a whole nother, (laughs) whole nother discussion. (laughs) It really could. Yeah. Yeah. When you say that, it kind of brings up an interesting thing that, you know, things are changing, right? The human body hasn't changed in however long yet our understanding of things is changing. So it's wild to me that some friends of mine with some heart issues are being recommended to go on like ketogenic diets, which I think years ago would have been unthinkable. You know, that that would have been something much different. Maybe Mediterranean. It seems like there was another one, forgetting the name of it. That was kind of the general idea of what the diet should be for heart healthiness. And it seems like it's evolving. And we're seeing much different recommendations. The, the Banting diet is becoming popular from cardiologists, which is, I mean, to me, that's kind of mind boggling and not that that would be so terrible to try to remember, but that's just one example. So you guys, doctors have a lot of stuff to keep track of. I, I, I don't think it's things haven't changed in so long. You got it easy. It's, there's a lot of stuff to try to keep track of. Yeah. The diet thing that changes a lot. It's, it's amazing to me. Like, like what could be more common than your diet? You would think we would have a little bit better information on what diets work and don't, but it's, it's pretty tough and it's tough to track because it's pretty hard to like an experimental trial. You want to control the variables. And I mean, you basically, it's very hard to like control everything. Somebody's going to eat for like months and months to see an outcome that's years in the future. You can't really track everything. Somebody's eating but a Mediterranean diet does seem to come out on top as a good general recommendation for everybody. I mean, that seems to be kind of the best in a lot of ways. Other people get good results from the ketogenic diets or Ornish or whatever, paleo, stuff like this. I mean, I think 
the problem is that with most diets is they're involving some sort of restriction, which is leading to the weight loss. People tend to eat less because they're restricting what they're eating. And so whatever works for you and, you know, can keep your weight at an optimal level is a great diet. So, you know, I don't care (laughs) as long as you've got like a reasonable amount of nutrients, even if it's, you know, 80% fat, but you're just not eating much of it. That's probably healthier than being overweight and eating a balanced diet, but just eating too much of it, you know? So diet is again, its own topic and uh, we're still kind of evolving on that. So the human body, the physiology hasn't really changed that much, but people are getting bigger for sure. Like the you know, obesity rates have really skyrocketed all across the whole Western world. Whatever we are doing and we're not even 100% sure, we're eating too much, not moving enough, maybe some other issues. But yeah, people are definitely getting heavier. And I guess what also is changing for us is that people are able to live with a lot of these problems. I mean, we're able to keep people alive quite well. You know, what we're not so good on is being able to completely cure their problems, but we can, you know, if you have kidney issues, I mean, we can give you dialysis. If you got cancer, I mean, we can give you chemotherapy to kind of keep it at bay. Sometimes we can't cure it and we can't cure your kidneys unless you get a kidney transplant, but we can, we can keep you going and, you know, we can treat all these other things. And what happens is you're getting heavier people who have a lot of problems who are living with a lot of problems. So they're becoming increasingly complex so, and it gets kind of expensive to care for because they have so many multiple, you know, things going on at once. So I guess the basic physiology hasn't changed, but our morphology is changing a little bit and what medical problems people can live with. I mean, people can live a lot longer than they could with these problems in the past. I mean, they just wouldn't have survived 40, 50 years ago. Yeah. And a lot of that information is somewhat politicized, just kind of picking on, um, I think I saw a TikTok video or a YouTube video or something, maybe Facebook watch where there's a heavy set female talking to herself, right? Or somebody about it, eating a donut and, oh, that's bad for you. And, oh, what is it? Moldy and really like challenging the convention that obesity causes health concerns everybody's body is different and that there's no such thing as bad food and weight isn't um, a concern for health. And that's pretty insane because I think the data is overwhelming and has been for, oh, I don't know, a few decades. You're fighting that. That sucks. (laughs) We got our own set of uh, myths in our world, but man, that's like you're saying, the, the obesity epidemic is increasing and now you have information coming out, if you want to call it that, debating it. Just you're saying increasing acceptance of people who are heavy. You're saying it's just the way it is. Yeah. I don't know. You know. I don't think you should shame people, but I'm not sure we should accept it either. I don't think that's, yeah. Shame shouldn't be in the equation, but yeah, the misinformation like that's a little, little freaky, I guess. All we can do is try to keep the good info out there. Right. Yeah. Not caring is just as bad as shame. So we need something in between. But yeah, I mean, there's probably a little bit of that too. And, you know, honestly, we don't talk about it as much as we should because it's so ubiquitous now that like, honestly, I don't talk about as much as I should. I'm derelict myself because it's such a common problem. And I don't have that much time with people too. And I only see them once and then I kind of move to the next patient. But yeah, I mean, for people who are coming in with obesity related concerns and I'm and it's really critically affecting their health, I will tell them like, yeah, absolutely. But I really don't have the time to go through here are the options. Here's what's available. I can, you know, a little bit, but I I just, there just isn't enough time to sit down and go through all the different things. That's probably better handled by nutritionists and other things like that, that we can have sit down and talk about it for a while. Cause that's a complicated issue. You have to extract, you know, food diaries, what people are eating and, you know, people are, very, everybody, normally people kind of underestimate kind of the stuff that they're eating. And, you know, do I eat, you, this is a real common one, but, you know, do you, do you eat fast food very often or, you know, no. What'd you have today for lunch? Well, today I did go to McDonald's and, you know, and I got this stuff. What about yesterday? Well, yesterday I did go to, and then you're like, okay, so you're probably going a little bit more than you think, you know, or whatever. So. 
not realizing that the meal they had was 2000 calories. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, exactly. Like they just never even considered, you know, one of the best things they found for weight loss in a lot of ways is, is people to keep a food diary and, and, and really write down everything. Cause then they're like, wow, holy cow, that is a lot. You know, then they, they see it with their own uh, eyes, what's going on. So, yeah, it's pretty easy. I've kept you an hour. I really, I really appreciate you coming on. I, seems like there's more stuff to talk about. We could, a couple rabbit holes, we could uh, definitely go down. So yeah, I guess I really do want to thank you for stopping by and chatting. And I really enjoyed listening to uh, your points on education and even your diagnostic approach, not doing more than you have to. And that's good advice. You're always free, you know, when people go to the doctor, I mean, they're always free to ask, you know, do I really need to do this? I mean, that's fair, a fair question to ask your doctor. Okay. What are we going to do if we find X, you know, and do you want those things? You know, it's, we, you know, want you to ask those questions and it's perfectly fine to, you know, challenge, ask whatever your doctor, if you actually need to do something. Cause sometimes you don't, sometimes, sometimes we're even appreciative because we feel like we have to do something because we found something, but we really don't really want to do it. And in a lot of ways, it's really okay. So, I mean, just ask questions. Hopefully you have a physician who will be open and, you know, helpful and spend time with you to talk about it. Don't be scared because you don't have medical knowledge or whatever. Just make people explain things to you in a simple way that, you know, they should be able to do that and give you a very clear understanding of what the benefits of what they're doing are and what the risks are and all those other things. So that's excellent advice. Thank you very, very much, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm very, very easy to reach via social media. You can also reach me at Matt Fonzel podcast at gmail.com. Thank you Napa for sponsoring and thank you aftermarket radio network for hosting this podcast. So until next time, everybody take care. You've been listening to Matt Fonslow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the aftermarket radio network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com.